a family whose story I've been following from the start of the war, and I got to meet them all today. Reunited after surviving what everyone who has been through it is called hell on earth. So let me explain this. You may remember Joe Reamers. If you take a look, he's all the way on the left. He's an American in Ukraine. He's there with his wife, Dasha, who is Ukrainian. They first came on this show to talk about their own escape from Kyiv when Putin's invasion began. But Dasha's family had been trapped in Mariupol, where Russia has unleashed its most brutal and indiscriminate attacks. So next to Dasha, that is her father, Oleg. He works taking care of hospice patients and didn't want to leave them behind. And on the far right is Dasha's uncle, Gennady, a pastor of a church in Mariupol, full of people who needed him. Well, for weeks, Joe and Dasha have been living in agony with Oleg, Dasha's mother, and Gennady. They've all been living in hell. But they didn't want to leave Mariupol, which they still call the best city in the world. To them, it was. To Putin, it was a target. And if Mariupol is hell, well, you can guess who they think is doing the devil's work there. They finally had to leave or risk falling into the hands of the Russians. So I want you to listen very carefully to what they went through and how they feel about this war. At times they seemed shell-shocked. At times they seemed okay. But tonight at least, this one family in Ukraine is together, alive, and safe. So you're waiting for three weeks for them to come? Yeah. And we knew that every day the situation is getting worse in the city from what we understood from the news. So, yeah, that part was hard. Are you watching the the news and the pictures of Mariupol and thinking, what were you thinking? Yeah, I was, we were watching everything, every channel we could find, every, every page on Instagram, everything. What I was thinking, I don't know, sometimes you have hope, sometimes you think I'll never see them again. And <laughs> it's all just, <laughs> yeah, mixed feelings. When you were able to communicate with them, what were you saying to them? We were trying to make them try to go out of the city. Uh, most of the time, they would ask what's, what's going on here. Part of the reason for not going, I think, was, and, and they can answer this better, but was concern about if it was possible to leave. But also, they, they felt responsible to care for, um, basically, between two different churches where people were sheltering under. Mm -hmm. There were, um, I think, more than 50 people total, a lot of whom were elderly women that they were caring for. You know, Oleg was going back and forth between churches almost almost every day yeah. I think through through the shelling and everything. Oh like why 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 did you stay? Why didn't you get out immediately? We work for the Blue Cross mission and we took care of hospice patients located at the outskirts of the city. When the shelling began, the area was heavily and often under fire. So we had to move closer to the center and we were taking care of elderly women hospice patients. We moved our patients closer to the center, and when we lost our water supply and electricity in the city, we started an open fire and brought food there for these people. We used a big 30-liter cauldron to cook and power generators to produce electricity for the other people to come charge their mobile phones and devices. We were providing food for approximately 40 or 50 people daily. So you have to understand, he worked for this mission, but his, his brother is a pastor of the church where they were hiding, so he can maybe tell you more about this part. What are you thinking about now? Because he said, it looks like you have a lot on your mind. <laughs> I'm trying to learn how to smile. The pace of life there is completely different from what you can see and feel here. It was not normal life, but survival mode, because you had to give hope to those who were losing it or who were suffering from breakdowns. And even though it was hard for yourself to be in these conditions, and as the pastor of a church, it was not possible to give up, and I needed to try to hold it all together. It has changed me forever. We talked a lot about how the only hope is in God. And as we were in this situation, our only hope was God. And now? I continue living like that. It was an internal change, a big change. I continue living like that. My teaching is what I truly believe now. God was protecting me. Did this make him question his faith at all? Or did it strengthen his faith? Faith just leveled up. I thought I had faith. 
But when I had nothing else, I just realized it's really big. Did it ever feel like this wasn't real? As if it was a dream? Did he think he was going to wake up from a nightmare? When they were bombing us from the planes, because it was hard to believe the bombs were floating down so easily. I witnessed horrible things. I told myself, I see it, and it's really happening. What was the ultimate decision, deciding factor for them to come? Because they didn't want to leave. They wanted to help all of these people. Why did they ultimately decide to come, to leave? There was one day when I went out to call my son, and he said, leave the city. And my wife was cooking over an open fire, and there was an explosion, and she started shaking. I just couldn't do it to my wife anymore. I would never forgive myself if something happened to her. The expressions on your faces speak louder than the words. He's looking at his brother. He's worried about his brother. What is he thinking? We were together. We shared our problems. Big past. What are you thinking? Next question. You're looking at him almost in tears. He's looking at his brother, and I can tell he's worried because he's studying him. Uh -huh. And he is thinking about a million different things as this is going on. Uh -huh. I left on the 23rd. My house was destroyed and my garage and car. The church we were living in was shot by a tank and destroyed. I didn't want to leave because I would be the last person to leave the church as a senior worker. But there was a moment when a child center director came to me. He's a man of big faith and he told me, leave Mariupol for a month or two because you will be put in a cell because everyone knows your pro-Ukrainian position. Do you feel guilty about leaving? A little bit for the members of my church that I could have taken on foot, but we were under fire. Are you going to go back? The longer I stay here, the less likely. How can I live with people with a different understanding? Are you going to, do you want to go back? I would love to return to Mariupol when it is under Ukrainian control. I would happily come to rebuild the city. What do you think of um, the Russians and Putin? Biden was asked about Putin and called him a butcher. I agree with him. Putin doesn't understand what he is doing. He is just a tool in the hands of the devil. What would you say to him? What do you want him to know? I would like him to come to Mariupol and see how people lived and died. Would love him to experience that. Russians are starting to believe in their own propaganda lies. I had a heated discussion with a Russian officer. He was convinced that they had come to help us. He said he would free us from the Nazis. I looked into his eyes and he believed it. I told him I was Russian, and I've never seen a single Nazi in Mariupol. He was surprised. What did he say? That he has seen Nazis at that checkpoint. They checked us for tattoos, and that's how they checked for Nazis. How many checkpoints? Twelve checkpoints. And you had to do it every time? It was only Russian military checkpoints. They said that they were mobilized. They didn't choose to go to this war, and they were made to do it, and it wasn't their choice. What was, how many people left with them? Seven people in the car with us. Were they worried that they weren't going to make it? Three times we were under fire. As we were leaving a checkpoint, shells were exploding everywhere. People dove into the field and covered their heads. One person was hit by shrapnel, three cars ahead. Did they have food? I didn't have time to gather food. We only had flatbreads and two cans of fish. The whole journey took around five days. Did you feel like this was hell? Like, is this ever going to be over? When is this going to be over? It was like a different reality, taken out of your normal life. It was new. It was a state of not knowing what was going to happen. Once you got here, once you saw them, what was your reaction? We're waiting for them. <laughs> We're glad they're here. I think in all of, all of human history, there's never been a guy who was more excited to get a call that his in-laws were coming to visit. <laughs>
it doesn't really feel like the crisis is over. Yeah. <laughs> it we um more Dasha and more them, but we still know people who are there. We we know people who are waiting for that reunion that we got, who still haven't gotten it and, and probably yeah. won't ever get it. Are you going to be okay? Yeah? Yeah. Are you going to be okay? <laughs> Are you going to be okay? How do you want this to end? How do you want this to end? What exactly? The, the, the interview war. The war? <laughs> the interview now. The war now. How do, you, how do you want this to end? As Oleg said before, that Mariupol stays Ukrainian and we can go back. It's the best city in the world. <laughs>